A very good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another session of the RSM Spring Speaker Series. Today, we're very excited to host uh, Revan Marat Lloyd um, talking about Black Network Resistance Strategic Rearticulations in the Digital Age. But before we introduce our uh, speaker of the day, I would love to introduce our moderator of the day and um, also RSM uh, Rebooting Social Media uh, Visiting Scholar, uh, Merit, Dr. Meredith D. Clark, uh, who is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Department of Communication Studies and director of the Center for Communication, Media, Innovation and Social Change at Northeastern University. Uh, Dr. Clark's, Dr. D. Clark's research focuses on the intersections of race, media, and power, and has been published in top communication journals and publications, including New Media and Society and Communication in the Public. Her first book, We Try to Tell You All, Black Teeth Twitter and the Rise of Digital Counter Narratives, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Meredith, Dr. Meredith, uh, happy to have you here. and. Uh, uh, let's start the call. This is on? Yeah, it's all right, on. All right. Wow, okay. So I can sit down and do that. Actually, I can't. So I have to go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'm so sorry. And I'm going to tell you why I have to do it this way. Um, so I'm a graduate of an HBCU, a historically black college or university, and we have very specific approaches to education. And when you stand up before a group and you're presenting or talking, um, we were required to stand. So even in forums where we're just asking questions, unless I really feel like I'm among friends or I'm frankly just too tired to do it, I will stand up and introduce myself. But this is not about me. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Raven Mara Lloyd. And in addition to being uh, just an outstanding scholar, I want you to know that she's a wonderful person, a wonderful human being. And I trust, colleagues, that you will give her your attention and your friendly faces because I have told her that we are a friendly bunch of folks, that we are enthusiastic about the research and looking forward to hearing about it. So a little bit about Dr. Mara Lloyd. Uh, Raven Mara Lloyd studies the intersections between race, gender, and digital media culture. Her first book, Black Networked Resistance, was published in January by UC Press. <laughs> She explores the shifting nature of Black resistance strategies like humor, care, and archiving online. More broadly, her work makes central the ways that Black and African American folks tap into long existing channels of communication toward the goals of community, survival, and visibility. Dr. Mara Lloyd holds a PhD from the University of Iowa, and she is currently an assistant professor in the Department of African and, and African American Studies and the program in Film and Media Studies at St. Louis, or excuse me, the University of Washington in St. Louis. Uh, one of Dr. Mara Lloyd's most recent publications is Digital Pleasure and Danger, a roundtable discussion. And if I read this correctly, I believe this came from a forum that she hosted at WashU last year, which brought together feminists, black feminists working in this area to have a discussion about what it's like to engage in online spaces in terms of building community and protecting the communities that you love. In addition to her book, she's working on a couple of projects or she's published the book, but is working on a couple of projects that I hope she'll talk to us about today. Uh, but we had the opportunity to fellowship over breakfast this morning and I saw that in addition to the work that she does as a researcher, she is a mom of two, she is a wife, she is a dog mom, and as I said, an altogether wonderful human being. So colleagues, please join me in welcoming Dr. Raven Mara Lloyd. <laughs> 
All right, thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for that introduction. Uh, okay, you know I'm sensitive, thank you. <laughs> um, I am thrilled to be here today. Thank you all so much for being here, to Dr. Clark for hosting, um, and the RSM team and, and the whole Berkman Klein team has been um, wonderful to work with, so thank you for, for hosting me. Um, I am here today to talk about Black Networked Resistance, and forgive the like postcards I passed out. We have a new Office of Public Scholarship, and they're very excited to print things for us. So like, you know, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that, but like, hand them out. I don't know, and have fun with beans. Um, okay, so I will talk about a chapter of the book today, the Karen chapter, um, but I'll broadly introduce the book and a little bit of the projects I'm working on. Um, so Black Network Resistance is about Black online users engaging in activities that are often passed off as insignificant or unworthy of internet inquiry. Um, for me, the book came out of um, questions I had around 2014 and again in 2017. Um, 2017 after the murder of Michael Brown, I was seeing a lot of discussions online related to um, hashtag Black Lives Matter, of course, and lots of protests, right, related to the hashtag. But what I wasn't seeing was um, conversations about how people um, live and resist that weren't like official activist narratives, right? Like my friends and I were sharing memes with each other. And, and that was our like way to um, stay upright, right? And so that's sort of where this project come from, come, came from. So for me, that meant taking seriously Karen memes as pushing back against centuries of white supremacy and vitriol wrapped in the form of protecting white femininity and thus the nation. Um, the book meant taking seriously the ways that black women show up for each other online, even when their needs are not prioritized or worse, erased, right, through loyalty to the race narratives. Um, the book was also an opportunity for me to wrestle with this idea of resistance um, as overdetermined. So as one of my students said recently, actually, um, I can get that off. Okay. As one of my students said recently in class, we're talking about resistance again, right? So like, I'm, I'm thinking through these ideas of resistance. Um, and while I agree that black folks and other marginalized groups should be able to be ratchet or mad or sad, um, just for the sake of being, I don't necessarily think that resistance and joy are antithetical to each other. And I'm happy to have um, further conversation about that. And hopefully we do. I want to start by defining the theoretical grounding of the book, so bear with me for two slides um, on some theory stuff. I use the cultural studies conceptual framework of rearticulation, um, which is a mouthful, and shout out to Dr. Rebecca Wanzo, who was like, take that out of the title in terms of the before the colon. She was like, you need something snappier, right? <laughs> um, to signal the reorganization or reshaping of ideological themes to advance an alternative agenda. So in the talk today, I'm thinking through the strategic reshaping of black humor specifically across time periods and media platforms such that black humor responds to um, differently responds to the changing faces of domination. In this case, white femininity and its ties, historical ties with the police state. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then for network resistance, the definition is made up in the book of three integral pieces. First, I'm framing digital resistance historically in order to place the roots of contemporary advancements of racial justice with our forebears, especially when we're doing work on digital media. We know this, right? It's really important to historicize um, and contextualize um, whatever inquiry we're doing, in my case, um, Black histories. Um, so, 
advancements of racial justice with our forebearers, many of whom were black women who experimented with and laid the foundation for successful strategies from economic divestments to care networks. These linkages help us to understand not only what worked or not in the past, but also how black publics have crafted and reshaped resistance strategies towards specific ends. Second, I'm focusing on resistance itself as connective and iterative, um, centralizing the agency and brilliance of black folks past and present who create and reshape resistance networks, not only for our current needs, but for generations to come. So like this conversation is also thinking through Twitter and X and like the movement of platforms, which um, black publics are not beholden to, right? And then third, an intervention in and outside of digital spaces prioritizes racial justice as diverse and unobligated to specific platforms or online versus offline debates. Given that so many media technologies from pamphlets to the black press to Twitter or X are imbued with their own sets of power laden inequalities, I focus on interventions across the milieu in hopes of rescuing resistance narratives from a reliance on any particular media tool or even a space of impact. I'll briefly mention um, another project I'm a part of and we can talk more about it during Q&A if you're interested. Um, my approach here of historicizing digital media um, and the approach of historically lived experiences as they deeply impact the technological world around us helps me think through other projects. So another one I'm a part of um, with a research team is we're working on identifying global misinformation campaigns um, across three continents, the US, Kenya, and country, Kenya, and the Ukraine. Um, and uncovering what the sociocultural factors are that make certain users perhaps more vulnerable to misinformation campaigns than others. So this is a multi-year and mixed method approach. We're running focus groups, survey data, and then pulse data, so like um, user data online. Um, and what we're trying to figure out is again, like what makes people vulnerable to online strategic information operation campaigns. So you'll sort of see this thread through my talk today about um, offline variables, sociocultural variables, as they impact online movements. I mentioned this project too, because I know some folks here are working on algorithms, right, and have for a while. Um, so if that sparks your interest, I'm happy to talk more afterward. Okay, so let's get to the juice, the good stuff. I'm gonna play a quick video of Hermit Patty. Um, let me give you some background information if you're um, unaware, but hashtag permit Patty first aware, appeared online in June 2018 after a white woman, Allison Edel, in California called the police on a young black girl, Jordan Rogers, for selling bottled water without a permit. Black users then extended the alliterative name permit Patty to several cases involving white women who align themselves with the police state to try to keep black folks in their place. Um, in the chapter, I also engage with the broader internet character of a Karen, um, who at least within the last four years refers to a white woman unnecessarily calling the authorities on black individuals. I'll talk about earlier aesthetics of the Karen too, the bob cut, the scowling face. Um, it's a whole character, right? <laughs> These two cases reveal existential dangers for black individuals existing particularly in public spaces. just have to raise the volume a little bit. I'm on the sidewalk. Hi, I'm having someone that um, does not have a vendor permit that's selling water across from the ballpark. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the woman named <laughs> Patty reportedly said she didn't actually call the police on a child who was selling water on a San Francisco sidewalk. But phone recordings obtained by a local news station prove otherwise. Okay, one second. Let me chance you over to the police department. Hang on. Great. Thank you. Her name is Allison Edel, and she resigned from her job after getting backlash when this video spread of her claiming to call police on an eight-year-old girl who was trying to raise money for a trip to Disneyland. She called the police on an eight-year-old little girl. You can hide all you want. The whole world gonna see you, boo. Yeah, and um, illegally selling water without a permit? 
yeah. on my property. It's not your property. Edel told the Huffington Post she didn't actually call 911. She was just pretending to because the girl and her mother were being loud. She also said she regretted her actions. Hi, I'm having someone that um, does not have a vendor permit that's selling water across from the ballpark. <laughs> The call later cuts off, and it's not clear if Edel hung up or got disconnected. But the police reportedly did not show up. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Mara Montalbano. All right, so after the 2018 instance, right, of Alison Edel reportedly calling the police, um, Jordan Rogers' aunt then put up this tweet that's on the far right um, with the hashtag permit petty and the character was born. We see from there, black users started to use permit petty um, using humor, right? Like we got a new meme, y'all. <laughs> um, and then you see other sorts of memes with humor interspersed. Um, to the left. <clears throat> Since the permit patty incident, San Francisco has passed the Karen Act, which many of you may or may not have heard of, or the Caution Against Racial and Exploitative Non-Emergencies Act. This points then to the connections between online black humor and policymaking, right? For the chapter, um, I scraped about a thousand um, Instagram posts and Twitter posts related to the hashtags Permit Patty and Karen. Um, I scraped the keywords with and without the hashtags um, to get posts where people were talking about Karens without the hashtag as well. I chose Twitter as the platform of analysis or X. I'm going to keep calling it Twitter, okay. Given its material and social allowances that map onto existing black linguistic and cultural practices, such as call and response um, and humor as resistance, of which I relied on folks like Dr. Clark's work, right, who wrote a whole book on black Twitter. Although less studied, Instagram also offers an additional layer of analysis as the platform's image-centered affordances allow for levels of creativity and imagination re regarding storytelling and resistance for Black publics. Memes, as we probably know, also thrive on both platforms, right? And then I conducted a historical comparative analysis of Black humor, which I'll talk about um, <clears throat> here. So embedded in many of the memes that you saw earlier um, reference there were references of heinous and dangerous behavior of these white women, but there was a unifying piece that I saw, and that was humor, and specifically black humor. So in, in the chapter, I'm not only interested in connecting the historical threads of black humor, but I, I saw um, users doing that work of placing contemporary iterations of white violence in historical context. We see that here with um, memes of placing Permit Patty, and then the other woman is Barbecue <laughs> Becky uh, on the bus with Rosa Parks, right? Okay, so uh, what I did then was try to understand the historical roots of black humor. So humor specifically allows black users to draw critiques of white womanhood in ways we have historically not been able to, given the well-documented and deadly consequences. Um, historian Mel Watkins writes of humor as it stitches together the ways that black folks have had to navigate between their public engagements and their private selves. Um, he writes in an interactions with whites, humor eased tensions that might otherwise have exploded into violence. Uh, in the privacy of completely black settings, black humor was more acerbic, end quote. Another tension of black humor is that of grief and grievance. So I'm thinking through public private and also grief and grievance as Glenda Carpio writes, writing about African-American expressive culture and the tragic comic mode, Carpio describes the grief and grievance that black humor activates through both a cathartic release um, and political critique. I'm also thinking of Bambi, Bambi Hagen's work where she talks about unclenching the jaw, right? So like you're walking around with a clenched jaw your whole life and humor is the thing for black folks where you can just like relax and unclench for a minute. Black comedians have long existed in this space between the privacy and acerbic black humor, and, and between privacy of acerbic black humor and public, perhaps more palatable forms of humor. I'm thinking about Richard Pryor, Moms Mabley, right? Um, 
as some of the most famous. So in the chapter, I talk more specifically about the Chitlin circuit, which is known for um, black performers, like singers, but actually a lot of comedians traveled the country as well, um, telling jokes. Okay. Um, and then, so again, I'm thinking through public private, sort of that tension with black humor as a tightrope that black publics online are able to navigate given like the public affordances of social network sites, right? <clears throat> okay, so if black humor isn't new and has seen various iterations in terms of what could be said in public, I also have to contend with white womanhood as the undergirding mode of power that Karen and Permit Patty Means are responding to. I want to be clear that I'm not talking about individual white women, right? I say this in my classes. I teach a Karen class. I say that in my classes all the time. Um, we're talking about like the structural um, elements of white womanhood, right? <clears throat> so white womanhood has long been granted access to ideologies of purity, virtue, and innocence, particularly during the Victorian age. Such access has placed white middle-class women at the center of the nation, which is to be protected at all costs. I'm writing a conversation with folks like Rekha Shom, Sarah Bene Weiser, Richard Dyer, and others who theorize white womanhood as ideologically tied to imperialism, modernity, and civilization. White women have historically then been positioned in contrast to the uncivil and pathologized other. Angelic representations of white women um, in art, cinema, poetry, and more, situate them in a position of moral superiority that uh, Richard Dyer writes required deference to their needs. Thinking about Karen's requiring deference, right? The ideal white woman further positions white imperial discourses by ensuring that the home as a microcosm of the nation produces civilized subjects for the future. So uh, to critique a white woman then is to critique an entire nation. So when black users create and reproduce photos from captured videos of white women yelling, running away, and calling the police, representations of the angelic, virtuous white woman are directly called into question. I think about what it would look like to create a meme of Hazel Bryan in 1957, here famously photographed screaming at Elizabeth Eckford, who was 15 in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, during desegregation. We know the Little Rock Nine, right? One of the first schools to be desegregated. Um, and many of you might know this, but the high school put the two women in conversation to, there was an event held years later where Hazel Bryan was invited with Elizabeth Eckford. Um, and the high school made it seem like they were friends and had a whole, they had a whole conversation. Elizabeth Eckford then, came out years later and said like, I don't know her, like we are not friends, right? <laughs> there was this post-racial moment that the high school was trying to um, position. So the affordances of memes and perhaps the aggregation of humor online situate critiques of white womanhood though a little differently. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through um, both arguments of the chapter, I'll focus on one. So I'm saying then that black online publics use humor as resistance. Um, I'll talk about the second theme here by using storytelling to create an inverse of stereotypes, exposing white womanhood's long standing relationship with the police state. So inversion or incongruity, I'm thinking through theories of humor here, inversion or incongruity is central to the makings of a comic scene. Um, black users deploy this humor technique as they play with and circulate the name Karen. Inversion is why we laugh at Michael Che, who's the NSL, um, he's on a Saturday Night Live, um, 2018 stand-up where he details being in an elevator with a white woman the occurrence, he says, happened not on purpose. The, he says the white woman grabbed her purse real tight in the elevator, and he said, I got scared. Mm. The inversion here is that Che, a black man, is the terrified one in a situation that often paints, paints white women because of their connection to vulnerability, right, and innocence, as fragile and threatened, particularly by black men. So we, I, in the post that I was scraping, I saw a lot of this inversion, right? Like here you see this example of, um, it took me a second, but I got it. I'm gonna use it without the hard N, Karen or care, right? So we're inverting the N word. 
um, to sort of point to how ridiculous it is uh, for Karen to claim um, innocence or vulnerability. Karen posts online function as humor precisely because of this classic inversion technique. What's more, Black people, and specifically Black women, have long had to contend with stereotypes of their names from school to professional settings. So I'm thinking through like the naming of Karens and the naming of Permit Patties. First names have become important for many Black folks who are crafting a new generation of familial heritage, particularly when we haven't had control over our names, right? Still, the jokes and stereotypes of Black names abound. Crystal Brent Zook writes about the actor and comedian Martin Lawrence, Though a black man himself, as he builds on and perpetuates these stereotypes and his problematic on and off screen relationships with black uh, women, so sorry to my Martin fans, I love the show myself, but it is, it's super problematic, right? Um, okay, so black woman specifically the deliberately named character Shanae Jenkins. Shanae played by Lawrence in drag is almost always seen with exaggerated buttocks, large earrings and colored hair extensions. Though she owns her own salon and is in a relationship, she often is shown as lusting after other men. Um, the details that make up the Shanene character are important in thinking about the, oh, that's my time. It's important in thinking about the intentional choice of a name and the importance of black users reversal of names through the deployment of Karen. So Karen can't become a stereotype in the same way that Shanene does, right, in stereotyping black women based on the power dynamics of each group. Um, but the name inversion serves its purpose in critiquing and creating a monolith of white womanhood, right? All of a sudden they become the stereotype. I'll end here. So through inversion, black users take control of the narrative of white women being able to call the police so easily by deploying in this instance, the reverse racism frame, right? Okay. In this example, black folks become the dominant group that complains about being discriminated against. The Karen examples here serve as rearticulations of humor vis-a-vis -vis the inversion technique. Users reshape inversion to weave together an incisive critique about white womanhood and its complicity with domination. Whereas traditionally, the most acerbic kinds of critique are reserved for private spaces where protection can be guaranteed, black folks use the affordances of online media to, to their advantage to achieve both protection and public facing critique. So the first theme that I didn't um, get a chance to get to is this idea that like we all um, add to a larger story of the Karen, which it, in um, essence like protects us. So you can't come for me personally talking about a Karen because there's thousands of us talking about Karens online. Sure. Um, protection and indeed credibility appears in the form of networked traction. That is the sheer volume of black users who add to the Karen conversation makes it both difficult to attack just one user and difficult to ignore the broader resistive narrative, which I think is super important. Like you can't attack one person in theory. Um, and also it makes a super visible conversation, right? Okay, so neither black humor nor its utility is a tool of resistance. Um, I was playing the audio. Neither black humor nor its utility as a tool of resistance is born of digital culture, yet black publics rearticulate the storytelling and inversion techniques by dispersing a resistance narrative among ourselves. So we also rearticulate past uses of the misanthrope to disrupt the assumptions of innocence ideologically attached to white womanhood. So I'm looking forward to a conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Should I stop sharing? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I can do it. Okay. Okay. Okay, am I on? I don't know. Uh, yes. Mic on? Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. This was delightful. I um, had the opportunity to see this recently in New Orleans yeah. and uh, just love having the opportunity to talk about things like care and needs and mm -hmm. show people that it's a lot deeper than, mm -hmm. than the fun and the jokes. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you briefly touched on this and before I get fully into the, the conversation piece, I'll say um, I think we have until 1.30. So I have a couple of questions just to warm things up 
as you're thinking about the questions that you may have, and I'll turn it over to the audience for those questions uh, in just a moment. But I, I like to get into a couple of things. I'm going to let these folks do the, the technical questions. I like to get into the methodologies yeah. and uh, the rationale and really the impetus for the research. Mm -hmm. So take me back to the moment when you realized that what you were seeing in terms of these memes was a thing mm -hmm. worthy of study yeah. and how you have made that argument, um, not only in your own research, but really for the field. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think uh, first, how I saw Karen memes being a thing honestly had to do with, I was lucky in that when I was going through grad school, black digital studies really started taking off publicly, mm -hmm. like in journals. And, and so the, because of folks like you, I was able to do the research in a rigorous way and people took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Even though like you still get told you're gonna to be pigeonholed or like it's just a meme, mm -hmm. books were starting to come out, journal articles are, were starting to come out, and not books yet, but like journal articles were, we, people started to take us seriously. Mm -hmm. In my own networks, like on black Twitter, there was never a question. It was never a question that Karen memes or memes where we made fun of certain situation, like things we would DM each other about because it wasn't appropriate to share more publicly when, because they were funny, but this isn't a funny situation. Mm -hmm. My friends and I knew like there's this public and private tension. I'm talking about like sharing a funny Karen meme when, when people are dying. Right. Mm -hmm. So like there's a, there's a tension of like, how serious something is and how we use humor that not everybody understands. And that's what I wanted to get to with the research, Makes right? Yeah. Like making fun of something doesn't mean you're taking it less seriously. Yeah. It means you're tapping into a long historical tradition. And it's a survival tactic. Yep. Right? It's absolutely a survival tactic. Um, one of the projects that you touched on, and I, I did want to get a little bit more into it because I think it's important specifically for this audience um, talking about applied social media research. You mentioned that you're doing archival work yeah. and this project required mm -hmm. archival work and I think the digital archives are often an afterthought and I'm mm. curious about based on the experience that you've had um, attempting to retrieve some of these digital materials mm -hmm. What sort of things do researchers doing work in this area need from technologists uh, when it comes to preserving digital archives and making them available? Yeah. Um, skill sets. So we know that sites like X make it harder now to download and archive content, especially like having to pay for said content. So I love going to workshops that that are accessible to humanities folks. Um, so we have computer science folks and humanities folks working together to like gain the skill of how to scrape mm -hmm. data and sort of make um, scraping data less intimidating, um, but also listening to humanities folks. Like there's a history of whatever topic that like we should probably know before you just scrape data and make assumptions yes. or conclusions about so like I love a good workshop um, I don't know if that answers yeah absolutely it absolutely does um, one of the follow-up question to that is about you know if there were something that you could reshape about the the corpus that you used um, is there an access point or is there a means of access that you yeah. might change or want to see designed differently Ooh, that's that's what's hard about the book is like when it's done it's, it's done, done right <laughs> and it's out which is great i think but also definitely there are certain things i'm like oh i wish i would have added that um uh i was lucky in that when i was pulling data from twitter this is before x so like i had sort of access to pull keywords um fairly simply um i have some like there's some platforms i barely get into like TikTok because it was newer as the book was coming out. So 
maybe I could have spent more time with newer platforms. Um, but the beautiful thing about doing historical research, like media history mm -hmm. is I centralize black folks history and not the platform itself. Right. 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 Um, so less of a technological yeah. determination. Right. You, yeah. That that's the, the place, the, the spot for mm -hmm. the inquiry to be centered. Makes sense. Um, one of the things that I'm going to bring up something that you did in New Orleans, and I loved it because, especially for uh, scholars who are just entering the mm -hmm. field um, or scholars who are working on their early book projects, I, I thought it was really artfully done. You said that there were questions that you presented in the book that you plan to take up later in your work. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about some of those questions yeah. that you'll be pursuing? Um, the last chapter, I follow the hashtag, um, the Black Delegation. Do y'all know about the Black Delegation? It's a Chappelle Show skit, Chappelle Show, Dave Chappelle, this was 2006, I think. Um, and he has the racial draft skit where he like uses humor to have a whole racial draft. We can, we can pull up the episode later if you want. It's pretty funny. But I saw folks on Twitter using hashtag Black Delegation and sort of using the hashtag as a way to like talk back to power in terms of Clarence Thomas and other folks. Um, and then I saw it again on TikTok. So I'm like, what is happening with this hashtag over the course of like decades, mm -hmm. right? Like yes. we are not forgetting. Not at all. Um, may, maybe some folks don't know about its origin, but like we're, we're not forgetting the, the conversation. So the last chapter, I um, I'm thinking through this idea of black evergreen network. So I have a journalism background and I'm thinking through evergreen content as content that never goes stale. Mm -hmm. You write a story and they shelve it for mm -hmm. until they have a free moment to publish, right? right? So that's what I'm thinking with black evergreen networks, um, not necessarily content, but these networks of black users that sort of like tap into these conversations at any point decades later, um, which I think predates the internet, right? Like this is sort of intergenerational yes. knowledge. Um, and so that's something I left in the chapter that I'm, I'm interested to pick up again as, you go on. as I go on. Makes sense. Uh, my last question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to our colleagues here. Um, Raven is incredibly uh, humble and, and doesn't you know, promote herself the way I am about to promote her in this moment. But she mentioned the uh, digital black studies, critical digital black studies being sort of coming into its own mm -hmm. as she was doing her early doctoral work. And she is a certified part of this canon. If you're not citing her work and you're working in this space, it's a hole that people are going to call out if they are equipped to read the work. I want to ask you, for people who want to be well-oriented um, to digital Black studies, studies of culture within Black digital spaces, who else should they be reading? Mm. Ashley Green Wade has a book, Black Girl Auto Poetics, out right now. Um, and I love the way she works with method in that book too. So like centralizing black women and also like listening to their stories as, um, serious research. Um, so black girl auto poetics is out right now. Tanya Sutherland's work, yes. the black resurrected body yes. is out. Um, of course, Meredith D. Clark, we know this, Ooh. um, we know Andre Brock's work. We know yes. Catherine Knight Stills work. Um, that's a, that's, that's a, a good solid list. list. That's a solid list. list. Yes. Yeah. You're reading there. You will definitely find the pathways that you're yeah. looking for. Uh, I believe we have about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. I'm going to leave it to you to point out people. Yeah, yeah. sure. Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do us a favor and introduce yes, yourself please. so we know who you are. Um, hello, my name is Gianna. Uh, I'm a CS PhD at Northeastern studying um, algorithmic folk theories. Yeah. <laughs> um, algorithmic folk theories in like optimization on TikTok, uh, specifically within the context of like black and brown folks and like non-binary folks. Um, and I was wondering, one, how do you particularly like both of you guys? Like I guess like, find joy within your work. Uh, my advisor is kind of like, okay, if we're gonna go down this research path, um, just know that it's going to be a lot. Um, and then two is 
when it comes to like specifically in CS, like there's a huge like jump for like what is the technical contribution, um, mm -hmm. and like for me, I'm still in the the phase of like trying to figure out what that is, nor how I want to like kind of like bring that on because like for me personally, I'm more interested in like, the critical piece. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess those are my two questions. Joy. <laughs> Okay, I made the decision early on, I'm going to focus on black folks and black publics um, and counter public, you know, and all their iterations. So although white supremacy comes up inevitably, uh, that's not my lane, right? So I'm going to leave it to, I gave a talk recently, someone was asking about like white conservative women and how they're using Karens. And I was like, that's great. You do that, right? Yeah. So like, I'll talk about Karens, I'll research Karens, but I'm interested, you saw it in this chapter in black humor, right? Um, and so for me, that brings that brings me joy to um, focus on us. And is there a specific technical contribution that you're yeah. seeing? What was the second part? Technical, just like technical, like when in HCI or so, you yeah. have someone that's like, in HCI, you'll have someone that's like, oh, okay, but like, what can yeah. this bring to the field, like, yeah. a design, or like, what type of methods do you think? Mm -hmm. Which is not always necessary. Uh -huh, However, uh -huh, within uh -huh. CS, like, publication is currency, so like, uh -huh. finding, like, forms that is, like, contributing to the space yeah. is helpful. In my collaborative work, so... I like to work with like, so you're in computer scientists or in computer science. Um, I find it useful to like keep those spaces diverse. So even as I'm working with computer scientists, I want to bring humanities folks along in the conversation. So I'm not the only one. And so I'll point to research, like I'm saying publish, like have your area, but publish, um, widely ish you know what i mean so like i'll point to the technical narratives of algorithms that i do and also write the book on um critical space does that make sense so like yeah okay you sort of have to have both absolutely I, if i could pick up just yeah. a little bit of that um the, the course i teach at northeastern this semester on race and technology we just talked about this last night and uh, Dr. Sarita Amrute has an essay about attunements mm -hmm. and how we can use uh, corporeal attunements, the attunement of the glitch, and there's one more that she has, um, as a way of rethinking the approach to technologies mm -hmm. uh, that instead of focusing on dominant approaches and dominant narratives of what technology is and how it should be studied, how it should be developed, we take the narratives of those people on the margins, their experiences, and use those as the starting point for our design cues. And I think as uh, Dr. Mara Lloyd is saying, what is so important about publishing interdisciplinary work is that those folks who are in the fields that you're in need that sort of literature to be able to make the case to their advisors, to their colleagues. And so it's this is why it's critical that that publication happens throughout and across the borders. Mm -hmm. Very well said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mike? Oh. By the time I encountered the Karen meme, it seemed like it had been stripped of its racial content and it meant somebody, an overly demanding customer who would summon the manager over trivial things. So it seems like the meme started in the black community and by the time white people encountered it, it, yeah. it, it didn't have that content anymore. Does this often happen? Yes, <laughs> right? We're talking about mainstreaming of content. What's interesting is the Karen starter pack or the call your manager meme mm -hmm. actually predates mm -hmm. what we know in 2020, right? So <laughs> if folks um, are familiar with uh, Kate and John plus eight, remember that reality yep. show on TLC? Yep. Yes. Um, I can show you a picture, but okay. she's blonde. She has the, uh, the Bob, right? <laughs> the full on Robert. Exactly. <laughs> the, the Bob, she has a scowling face. And early internet folks in the early 2000s were using the call your manager meme. So yes to being stripped of, of like black humor, but I would say it's, 
black humor is not meant to be foregrounded for everybody. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just for us, right? And Karens can still serve their purpose in making visible um, white womanhood and yeah. its vitriol in some instances. Hi, I'm Aileen Fiddler. I'm a law professor and an affiliate here at Berkman Klein. Um, these are comments, which I know are sometimes the worst, but I'm going to reframe yeah. them as invitations, uh, since one thing that we do here is interdisciplinary conversations. Yeah. Um, so I'll do the boring one first. Uh, you all might already be a part of this, but I'm part of the Coalition for Independent Technology Research, which helps folks doing exactly the work that you're doing if you face legal barriers to getting data, that kind of thing especially as we look ahead at what might happen in the, the big election, that might be um, yeah. a good thing for y'all to, to get plugged in with. I'm happy to talk more. My second comment was the thing that struck me the most coming from the legal side of things was that phrase that you use that online black humor allows black folks to get the protection that they usually have in private and public. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think is missing from conversations about regulating social media. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you're interested in uh, that conversation, I think that would be a really cool point to, to bring forward. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. I actually have one in the back. Oh. 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 <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam Holland. I'm a project manager here at Berkman Klein. And this is going to be, I think, trying to bridge the gap between the technical question and your experiences with. Um, the, I guess the repercussions. So I manage a database of requests to take things down from online. And what I'm curious, and if this is too deep, feel free to find me later, but as you began to examine a broader corpus of um, social media posts and other participation online in this um, humorous resistance space, I wonder if you also saw what I'll just sort of simplify as pushback using digital affordances, which is you have a, a constituency that's claiming these new tools to continue what you've artfully framed as a long historical pattern. I'm wondering if you saw people sort of saying, oh man, I, I, I can't allow this. And I'm going to use digital tools to try to censor, suppress, and otherwise um, defang this newly effective modality. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I like the way you put that Thank defang. You. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't my focus. Um, but yes, so in the case of almost all the women, Permit Patty, there's Barbecue Becky and others, um, what's interesting is they mostly use official channels to counter what was happening to them online so we mostly saw them on the today show or other news channels trying to like pr the situation probably rightly so like going online and creating an anti-karen campaign just would sort of feed into the narrative it would it would just like help <laughs> right the the original means um so there's this like mainstream and online thing that's happening. Um, I'd like to censor the conversations. So censor is probably too loaded a word. I apologize. Yeah. If I could yeah. take that up for a second, mm -hmm. um, I would say that arguably that's exactly what Elon Musk has done that's right. with what he has done in dismantling different departments right. and part of Twitter in specific. Um, and you're also seeing sort of the offline application of this as well. Uh, so in, in the case of Twitter with Elon Musk firing so many engineers oh, yeah. and changing the affordances of the site itself, it makes it difficult for people to mm -hmm. circulate the information and for even the jokes to have the traction that they once had. In the offline application, one of the ones that I've seen most recently, and it was honestly kind of alarming to me, mm -hmm. I went to, um, one of, I'm trying to remember which health, I went to urgent treatment here recently uh, over in Boston, and there is a sign at the check-in desk that says that clients are prohibited from filming interactions within the office. And they what they really mean is the interactions with the staff. 
Mm. And so it's like, if we cannot stop you yeah. from circulating and protesting in this way, uh, if we can't get you, you know, to mm -hmm. go through the official channels for raising complaint, then we're going to silence you by saying you can't use the technology at all. And that was something that I never anticipated. It's one thing for the affordances to be changed. It's a, another thing to ban a certain account. But to say that people can't totally. even use the hardware yeah. to capture the video, upload the video, and circulate that narrative is a completely different level of silencing that I, for one, was not ready for. There are also claims of harassment, right? So, like, um, and, and have, to be sure, some of the women here probably did get, oh, you know, like uncalled for parts of harassment. But when we see um, conversations about doxing and harassment as like the top of conversation when it comes to Karen, it shifts the conversation differently. And it's a 1% uh, conversation that starts getting like most of the online traction when, mm -hmm. when maybe that's not always the case. Uh, time for one more question. One more question. Yeah, my question is related to, I think, online humor yeah. uh, and the system or the infrastructure that circulating images and even producing images affords anyone from any ethnicity or background or uh, country of origin or whatever. And I wonder, what would you respond to a person that uh, <clears throat> puts these uh, faces of people and these individualities that are not necessarily docs, but sometimes exposed online uh, in the same, um, how do you say, level of, for instance, um, I, I've, I've seen some, ca some cases of white nationalists interviewing protesters and yeah. catching them off guard yeah. and making humor out of it and it also exposing them and yeah. um, mm -hmm. how, what, what's that take of humor or what's that infrastructure yeah. doing in terms of humor and I mean beyond to judge what type of humor that is but uh, how can, how can you uh, explain a little bit better? Yeah. Yeah, better. I do. I, I, the one that I have is um, the importance of disambiguation. Like, what are we talking about when we're talking about the application of humor, the use of humor, what is interpreted as humor, yeah. and what is the intent of the individual who is creating the meme and the individuals who are circulating the meme? There are definitely bad faith actors whose intent is to harm. Um, what I see, and of course I've got an insider perspective with a number of these memes, what I see is this protective measure that, you know, you haven't had the opportunity, you know, it, it could cost you your life to confront someone in one of these situations. So one of the only areas of recourse that you might have if you're being harassed by someone who has the ability to invoke the police, to invoke the power of the state in that moment, if one of your only avenues is to make it public and for people to take that up and to have fun with it and to use it as um, a shield, if you will, from I know that this was harmful treatment. I know that it hurt you. You are seen. Uh, and at the best, we're going to make fun of it. Then that's one thing. It is another to extract a moment to position it towards an audience um, that is already predicated yep. on stripping you of your humanity and then making you a target. Mm -hmm. And I see those as completely different things. I think yep. Joe Walther's uh, work on hate that he's doing exactly. right now and social approval and hate is really going to, to bear that out. That's what I was going to say. I think it has to do with positions of power, right? So um, Black folks making fun of uh, an instance is different than tapping into centuries of uh, white supremacy, right? Like in terms of material effects uh, of, of both. Like who is the power in the situation there? Yeah. Is that, is that one more hand? I saw that. Yeah, yeah. but you know, have to... no, yeah, go ahead. Since we're on the topic of white supremacy, <laughs> for those of us who do study white supremacy from a critical side and yeah. see white womanhood as you know part of this natalist ethno nationalist. Thing at the core of so much right-wing movement. Um, what 
what are, you, what do you find frustrating about us using that white supremacy lens all the time? Like I've taken note of some of these black digital studies people that you've just mm -hmm. given us, but from your perspective and your work, I'm so I'm a sociologist who also looks at like meaning making, et cetera. What what would you say to those of us who are in this sort of more visible camp? I don't know if that makes sense. Like what could what could we be looking at or looking for in addition to what the great help that you've given us today? Um, in terms of studying white supremacy online? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's just so white focused. Like, mm -hmm. and there's so much to right wing movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't know, but we often focus, you know, with this white lens. I don't know, not being very articulate, but. I think I get it. I think, okay. I think I get it. I can talk to you more after, too, if you yeah, want. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you. Okay. Personally, I would say I, I'm relieved and keep going. Right. Right. Because it's necessary. If you think about the timeline of history and what we're up against, um, I argue all the time that everything, particularly in the West and particularly in the US, I'm an Americanist in, in my work, our work generally focuses in the States, we're built on a broken foundation of genocidal attempts against Native Americans yeah. and the imposition of African chattel slavery. There's no getting that territory back. So the best thing that can be done is to place this intense attention on these historical imbalances and the historical imbalances of power and the people who have the most powerful ability, the resonant ability to do this are white folks. Our research gets ghettoized. It, we're told it's not rigorous enough. It's, you know, we're not, we're studying ourselves. Too it's personal. me search, right? It's too personal. Um, that's to me what allyship is to continue in this and to agitate and to be able to bring these narratives together. Exactly. And so that is why I would never say that the imposition of a lens of let's look at this as an outgrowth of white supremacy, it never gets tired because mm -hmm. that history mm -hmm. doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. I would say too, like studying all of that and studying the different faces of white supremacy or iterations of because it's not going to show up and hasn't showed up in the same way right it's been rearticulated online and other in other spaces differently and so like sort of tracking and following um discord and truth social and all these other spaces um is places super where it would kill your spirit to go truth right. social, yeah. i'm not going there <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going there 100 Yeah, so we all have marching orders. <laughs> Excellent. Are there any other questions, comments, offerings? Oh, there is one. Hi. Hi. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, it just occurred to me that one could have perhaps talk about other positive movements, like a little known one um, from the, the Central Park encounter. Um, there's an ornithologist here at, at Harvard who, during the pandemic, took a, a cross country bicycle ride, and spoke about that, and had a Black Lives Matter sign on his bicycle, and stayed with somebody who was a, a black bird watcher. There's an organization of black bird watchers. Um, and he didn't know about that. But then, then he came back and, and talked about this cross country trip and also talked about uh, a fundraiser for black uh, scientists to for graduate students to you know, for people who could contribute to that so these are you know two possible very positive uh, reactions to to the central park incident i don't know if you have any uh, response or, or i didn't know the detail with which uh, that that person um did the cross-country thing that's cool I mentioned the Karen Act too. Like I, I think I don't know about the positive, negative. Like what is positive exactly, mm -hmm. right? Because um, positive might be, I made it through today, um, <laughs> and the Karen means helped, mm -hmm. right? Um, at least to make me feel less isolated when these instances happen. Um, but things like the Karen Act also happened after many of these instances. It wasn't just permit patty or just like these aren't isolated instances. So like, I agree, other things are happening positively. I think the redemption narratives, there's, there's often um, yeah. a pressure on researchers who do critical work to 
uplift the redemption narratives. And I don't necessarily see that as the work mm -hmm. of those scholars, particularly those scholars whose lived experiences place them in a position to be on the opposite end, to be potentially harmed, to see their family members or people who are like them face that harm. I, again, see that as the work of folks who want to position themselves as allies. That is an excellent space for them to take up. Uh, but if I'm asked the question about why not the positive things, I say the positive things are resilience and resistance within the community. And so those are the narratives that I'm lifting up, that Raven is lifting up through that work. And we are happy to see those contributions come from our colleagues in the field. Because it's, it's resilience and doing everything else, right? And still finishing graduate school or <laughs> a book or two, right? Like it's it's making it through the day and doing all, yes. all the things. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much.